what are the factors that government should take into account. They are many. Obviously, they have to be thinking about how they feed their people. Obviously, they have to think about the supply and the demand of food in their country. And they have to make sure that food reaches the people. So there are issues that relate both to supply, there are issues related to demand, and there are issues related to trade. So those are the kinds of, of questions that they have to address. And they really cover the whole spectrum of decisions that government take in relation to the overall economy. So I think there's probably um, at least three factors that governments should take into account when making food policy decisions. Um, first, I think, is what the overarching goal should be. Um, so whether it should be kind of food self-sufficiency, um, whether it should be maintaining prices for urban consumers, whether it should be alleviating poverty. Um, a lot of these goals don't go together and there can be significant trade-offs. So um, I think you know governments need to be clear about what the objective of their, their policy will be and, and recognize that there will be stakeholder groups that are not so happy but try to avoid having kind of ad hoc reactive um, uh, policy volatility. I think one very important takeaway is that prices spiked in 2007 and 8. We have to try to learn from those spikes because prices have fallen since then but they will increase again. So it's important to think about what are the lessons that you can learn from past events like the 2007 uh, spike. Secondly, thinking about implementation capacity. So um, some policies involve more capacity than others. Um, we talk about kind of stroke of the stroke of the pen policy changes, um, like devaluation of a currency, um, where you know the Ministry of Finance decides it and it's done, versus starting up a large scale. A social safety net program or a fertilizer subsidy program um, requires a much higher level of capacity and might require even capacity within local government as well. What I would like the audience to take away from this session is that governments make policy decisions on the basis of the relative power and agendas of the stakeholder groups that influence the decision-making process, including but not limited to the government institutions themselves. Uh, we really need to understand how the policy process works in order to help governments make evidence-based decisions that would achieve the goals that they have. I think one of the main takeaways is we don't really have a good understanding of um, how you get political will uh, for policy change or, or, or lack thereof. Um, and I think uh, we can provide a lot of evidence about you know, the, the negative um, macroeconomic implications of certain policies or the negative um, implications for poverty or inequality um, or beggar thy neighbor um, implications of export bans. But um, I think without really understanding why you know, governments, despite having a lot of this evidence, still pursue some of these policies, um, we're still going to have a lot of trouble bridging that kind of research policy divide. And uh, it's not clear that any of us really know quite you know, how, to, how to better understand political will. I think that in terms of turning this research that we have been focusing on doing into action, I think the first point there is to actually try to understand the complexity of food price formation in developing countries. But one issue that I certainly could point to is when the 2007-08 uh, price spike set in, we were immediately told that this is going to create uh, widespread poverty. This is going to lead to death and hunger um, at a massive scale. I think that has proven that that's not exactly like that. Where the major impact here actually took place was in urban areas where among the urban poor which may not be at the bottom of the poverty pyramid. So they're reflecting on and really understanding the implications of food prices and how much they actually get transmitted to the poorest parts of societies which are often in the rural areas. I think that's one area and what that suggests is that we should really sometimes take a deep breath when the press goes out with the red lamps blinking we may want to sometimes step back and not jump on that wagon right away. The way that we can all contribute 
to a better and food secure and well-nourished world is to integrate into whatever we do a component that says how would that action affect the marginalized groups that suffer from poverty, hunger, and malnutrition? Uh, would it help them or would it hurt them? And it doesn't really matter what you do. Everybody has a role to play. Uh, if you can find no other role to play, you can donate some of your money to a non-governmental organization that is improving the lives of poor people. You can try to influence policymakers. If you are a policy advisor, you can work with the policymaker in making more informed uh, policy decisions. If you are a policymaker yourself, uh, take some risks that you might lose some support from some of your um, supporting groups, if necessary, in order to help poor people uh, become less poor. And it doesn't really matter what you do. Everybody has a role to play. Uh, if you can find no other role to play, you can donate some of your money to a non-governmental organization that is improving the lives of poor people. You can try to influence policymakers. If you are a policy advisor, you can work with the policymaker in making more informed uh, policy decisions. If you are a policymaker yourself, uh, take some risks that you might lose some support from some of your um, supporting groups, if necessary, in order to help poor people uh, become less poor.